Hello, everyone. Welcome to the FLAC 3D version 7 webinar. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, we've got about 45 minutes of information, mostly about uh, new features in FLAC 3D 7, but also some general FLAC 3D information. Um, so my name is Jim Hazard. I'm the software manager at Itasca Consulting Group. Um, on the call, we have David Russell, who is the chief software architect here and did most of the programming in FLAC 3D, and also Zhao Cheng, um, senior geomechanics engineer, who is our constitutive model expert and uh, also does some programming on FLAC 3D. Um, I will be doing most of the talking, but David Russell and Zhao Cheng are here to answer questions at the end, um, especially if they are complicated questions. So the way we are going to do this, we have um, a lot of people joining this webinar. And normally, we like to answer questions as we go along. Um, but I think because there are so many people, um, it might end up slowing the whole thing down quite a lot. So uh, I think the best thing will be to, to keep the questions to the end. Um, so what you can do is put your questions in the chat or in the questions uh, window of the GoToWebinar um, dialog there. And um, they will get recorded, and we will just answer them at the end. Um, if we don't get a chance to answer all of the questions, we will have a log of them, and so we can follow up by email afterwards. OK, so like I said, this um, webinar is mostly about new features in FLAC 3D7. But uh, I'm aware that some people on the call might not be FLAC 3D6 users or might not be FLAC 3D users at all. So um, what we're going to do to start here is um, have a poll just to see where you are in terms of FLAC 3D use. So I'm going to launch this poll. And if you could um, answer the questions so we can see uh, who's using FLAC 3D and who's using what version of FLAC 3D, and then I can sort of tailor the presentation a little bit, depending on um, how experienced you are with using FLAC 3D. All right, so we're at 50%. I'll just give it a few more seconds here. All right, so 65% voted. That's probably enough to get a good feeling for what people are doing. I'm going to close this poll and share the results. OK, so interestingly, 30% are already using FLAC 2D7, 20% version 6, 14% version 5, and 33% don't actually own a FLAC 3D license. So OK, knowing that, I will try to uh, point out things that are unique to FLAC 3D in general, as well as things that are uh, new in FLAC 3D version 7. So this is what the, uh, the schedule looks like. I've got one slide on just the basics of what FLAC 3D is. And then most of the presentation will be about what's new. Um, if there's time at the end, I have a case study showing how you could use some of the new features in a real um, and a real consulting problem. <clears throat> and then I have one or two slides about what we plan on putting into version 8. Okay, what is FLAC 3D? Um, numerical modeling software for geotechnical analysis of soil, rock, groundwater, and ground support. Um, you will hear a lot of people saying that FLAC and FLAC 3D are finite difference programs. That is not exactly true. Um, officially, they are a finite volume program. And the reason that that is important is that because um, the finite volume formulation allows you to have an unstructured mesh. So strictly speaking, the finite difference formulation assumes a structured um, perfect grid. That is not necessarily the case in FLAC 3D. We can have unstructured meshes. Um, we can have tetrahedral elements. We can have pyramid elements and wedge elements and so on. 
Um, and so this just is a lot more flexible than a true finite difference program. Um, what is true about FLAG3D is that it does use an explicit solution scheme. And this is also sometimes known as a time marching solution scheme. Um, and with this way of solving problems, we take a lot of very small time steps and the solution marches through in time so that information propagates through the model. Um, this is different than something you may be used to in other programs that use an implicit scheme where they just get to a, a steady state solution in one step. So we are often asked why we're using this explicit solution scheme. And the reason is that this is, in our opinion, a better scheme for um, difficult problems, problems that have highly nonlinear material behavior, uh, problems with large strain or geometrical nonlinearities, uh, and problems where dynamics are important and we're looking at wave propagation. So we're assuming that people using black 3D are more interested in these types of um, challenging problems and therefore the explicit approach is generally better um, for solving these types of problems. Okay, so flag 3D 7. Um, what we did is we took flag 3D version 6 and more or less rebuilt it using all of the modern day um, tools that we use for building software. Um, we have the latest uh, compilers, the latest development environment, and the latest graphic libraries. Um, this has led to faster and more robust plotting, um, more stable plotting on Windows Remote Desktop, um, and, and generally all around better behavior. The other thing that's new in Flag 3D7 is that all the documentation is now HTML. Um, and what this means is that you can actually view the documentation in a browser like Chrome or Firefox and use all of the capabilities that you have with your browser, like searching and so on. So Flag 3D7, this is just what it looks like. Um, this is the, the main window. Um, if you're used to Flag 3D version 6, it looks pretty similar. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out here, though, is that now in version 7, if you put your mouse on a keyword um, and hit F1, it'll bring up the help system, same as it did in version 6. But you can set it up so that it brings up the help in the sidebar here, and you can look at the help while you're doing your, your work on the, on the editor. Um, I should point out for those that are not uh, familiar with Flag 3D that it is mostly a command-driven program. Um, so a lot of the, the modeling that you'll be doing is with um, commands. Um, this gives you a lot of power, of course, because you can do almost anything. Um, it can also be a little bit challenging because you do have to figure out what these commands um, do and how to write them. And this is why we are trying to make it uh, easier with respect to opening up the help. You can, of course, set this up so that the help opens up in a browser as well. So another new thing to help you with writing commands is um, the inline help. So what this is, is basically an intelligent system for helping you write these commands. So if you know that you want to work on zones, you start typing the word zone and you hit control space, or you click on, click on the arrow at the side. And it will give you a list of possible keywords that will follow that zone. And then you can just click on one of them. So if I say zone create, I click on create, and then it gives me a list of keywords that I can follow that, and I can click on brick, and then I can click on group, and so on. And so in this way, it's very easy to build up the commands um, without, first of all, having to memorize them all, and second of all, without even necessarily having to type anything. OK, so that's just the, the basics uh, of what's different in Flag 3D7. Um, now I'm going to go through specific uh, new features and new improvements. Um, and first of all, one of the things that a lot of people are obviously asking us for is for the program to go faster. So we have spent quite a lot of effort trying to make um, FLAC 3D7 um, go faster. So the next few slides are going to show graphs that look like this. Um, and so what these graphs are showing is, is the speed on the y-axis and the number of processors on the x-axis. Um, and so what you can see is that obviously as you run these things with more processors, they get faster. They are multi-threaded, of course. Um, 
what's the most important part of these graphs, though, of course, is that um, the, the, the total speed up at the end when you're using all of your processors, you know, how much faster is it than it used to be? Um, these were all run on, on a desktop, an i9 desktop with 10 cores, so 20 processors. So for basic mechanical calculations, um, this is just a, a simple example. It's like a punch type problem with a, a load on the surface and a more Coulomb material. Um, this simple model runs about 33% faster in version seven than it did in version six. So now a you know, model that used to take three hours will take maybe two hours. If we look at fluid flow, so this is uh, just fluid flow calculation. The, the speed ups are more significant. Um, version seven, for the example that I tested was about 2.6 times faster than version six. Um, so now your three hour problem becomes about a one hour problem. This plot on the right here shows a, a real life consulting project that was done um, with Black 3D7, uh, was modeling a dam with impounded water. Um, so this is a, an example of a fluid flow calculation. You can see um, these red contours are showing you the saturated region um, where the impounded water is behind the dam. And so of course they were looking at the, the stability of this, um, of this situation. Um, the thermal calculations, the speed up is even more dramatic um, because before version seven, the thermal calculations were not multi-threaded at all. So if you look at the blue line here for version six, um, you can keep adding processors to the problem and the thermal calculation did not speed up. Whereas in version seven, it is now multi-threaded. Um, so we can get very significant speed ups in the thermal calculation. Um, another thing that's been sped up is the apply logic. Um, previously, the apply logic was not multi-threaded. Um, now it is. So the apply logic refers to applying um, stresses or forces to the boundary. Um, often you're not doing that very much, so it's not that important. But one situation where it is important is um, a free field type of problem. And so um, we use these free field boundaries when we're modeling global type earthquakes. So if you have a wave coming in from the bottom um, that propagates up through your structure, and you don't want that wave to be distorted on the edges of the model. We use these free field boundaries. And these are essentially just um, apply conditions that are applying forces to the boundaries every step. And so by multi-threading the apply conditions, um, this is a significant speed up for these types of problems. Um, over here, this is just a little movie showing what these types of things look like. So there's a, a wave coming in from the bottom uh, a shear wave, so it's we're looking at uh, velocity in the x direction, and you can basically see how it propagates up and down, and does not get distorted at the edges because these free field boundaries are there. <laughs> um, another aspect that's been sped up is these attach logic. Um, for those that aren't familiar with FLAC 3D, the, the attach logic is used generally to um, attach larger zones to smaller zones. And the reason you might want to do that is if you have um, regions of interest where you have smaller zones, and then you need to have bigger zones far away from the region of interest so you can get a, a more efficient um, modeling situation. So this is just an example showing an open pit mine. And again, small zones in the region of interest larger zones away from the region of interest. Um, and also in this particular model, we're modeling the faults as um, zones of weak material. And so these faults are shown in red, and these are even smaller zones. And so we have small zones in the fault attached to bigger zones in the host rock, attached to bigger zones far away from the region of interest. So there are a lot of attaches going on here. Um, and this type of problem is it's a very common way to do fact 3D modeling. And this is almost twice as fast in version seven than it is in version six. Um, for those that don't know FLAC 3D, I'm, I'm just putting this slide in here to show you that there are other ways to model faults. Um, modeling the faults as a weak zone is not necessarily the best way to model them. 
we do have interfaces in Flag 3D, and by interfaces, I mean faults or joints. Um, these are true discontinuities. You can have a shear movement along these joints. You can have um, opening, and you can have closing of these faults. So um, this is a, is a robust and um, fast way to model faults and joints in Flag 3D. Okay, another thing that we've done is um, added multi-threaded fish. So for those that don't know, fish is the built-in scripting language of Flag 3D. Um, this allows you to do all kinds of crazy things. Um, you can customize your models and customize your output and customize the physics, and you can modify almost every aspect of Flag 3D by using this scripting language. And this is really one of the main strengths of um, one of the main strengths of using Flag 3D is the ability to do this scripting. Um, one thing that people often do is they um, have some sort of script that is executed every time step. So maybe they want to loop through all of the zones every time step and do something to them. This, up until now, has been quite slow um, because the fish itself is not multi-threaded. In version 7, we added multi-threaded fish. So here's just an example. Um, in version 6, you might write a function like this on the top here, where you loop through all the zones and modify the shear modulus. In version 7, you don't need to write this loop. You can call that zone prop function and just send it a list of zones, and it will intelligently spray them out to all of the processors and run this in a multi-thread way. So this is potentially faster. Um, this zone prop is a built-in function that allows you to change the properties of a zone. You can also write your own function. Um, so if you add this operator keyword, then you can write your own function that will then become multi-threaded, and it works in the same way. Um, you give the name of the function, you send it some list that you want to split up over them over the different processors, and it will automatically do the multi-threading for you. So this is just a simple example of, of where you might use something like that. Um, this is included in the manual. Um, here is a, a model where they are applying a, um, a cold zone to the bottom left corner. Um, and then it's a thermal calculation, actually a coupled thermal mechanical. And so what happens is that when they have this cold point at the bottom left corner here, um, that cold region starts to propagate outwards and what happens is some of the zones start to freeze and so you can imagine that a frozen material behaves differently than a non-frozen material and so you want to identify the regions that are frozen and modify them and so here's a little function that essentially applies an expansion and changes the uh, the stiffness and also changes the stress if a zone is, is found to be frozen and so what happens here is that every step it loops through all the zones and checks if their temperature is below the freezing point. And if it is, then it will freeze them and, and do these calculations. Um, so you can imagine this is potentially quite slow, looping through all the zones every step. But with the multi-threading, it actually goes quite a bit faster. So this is just an example of the kind of things you can do with the multi-threaded fish. OK. so. That's all I'm going to say about speed. Um, the next thing is some new constitutive models that we've added to version 7. Um, there's a few new constitutive models, depending on how you count them. Um, plastic hardening model already existed in version 6, but we've added uh, some new capabilities there. Um, soft soil and soft soil creep are new, as well as NOR sand and the P2P sand model. So the plastic hardening model, you're probably familiar with this already. Um, what's been added here is, the, is this small strain stiffness option. Um, so in real life, the shear stiffness generally decreases with increasing shear strain. This is what this plot is showing here on the, on the left. Um, and what happens is you do a, a test in the lab to get the, the material properties, and those 
um, material samples are usually subjected to fairly large strains. So you might be getting a shear modulus that is lower than what you really want, because in situ, there will be less strain and the shear modulus will potentially be larger. Um, so this new option allows you to take that into account and um, you can specify a, a dependency of shear stiffness on the shear strain. We've also included the ability to have different um, stiffnesses for loading and unloading. So the right-hand plot is showing how that um, affects the, the solution. Here you can get these hysteretic loops because you have different loading and unloading stiffnesses. Um, the soft soil model, this was something um, that was done in collaboration with a company called Sage Engineers. Um, they were really interested in having this model. Um, this is a model that is useful for very soft soils, for example, peat. Um, there's a pressure dependent moduli. Um, the unloading and reloading is considered separately from initial loading. There's an elliptic, elliptical volumetric yield cap uh, that can expand. Um, it follows more Coulomb shear and tensile failure. Um, and then there's also the soft soil creep. So this is the same as the soft soil with a, an extra option that has um, sort of secondary time dependent compression. And that's what's being shown here on the on these little plots on the bottom right. Um, the left one here is just your standard, um, you know, pore pressure dissipation plot. Um, but on the right, you can see the settlement versus time. And so if you don't have the creep option, uh, once all the pore pressure is dissipated, it essentially stops settling. Um, but if you have the creep option, then you continue to get this secondary compression after the, the excess pore pressure dissipation. Okay, the North Sand model. Um, this is becoming increasingly popular. Um, probably because of some high profile tailings dam failures, um, particularly in Brazil. Um, this model is thought to be good for modeling tailings. Uh, and so it is something that a lot of people have been asking about. And in fact, this particular uh, development was again done in collaboration with uh, Valley, which is a big mining company in Brazil. Um, so this model is good for soils where Particle-to-particle -particle interactions are controlled by contact forces and slips rather than bonds. It incorporates a state parameter so that both shear hardening and softening can be captured, um, can be used for both static and dynamic analyses, um, captures a full range of soil behavior from static liquefaction of very loose soils through to dilation of very dense soils. Um, so that's what's being shown down here on the, the bottom right. Um, what we've got here is the deviatoric stress against the the mean stress um, and the dense sands are plotted in red and the loose sands are plotted in blue. And so what you can see is for the, for the dense sands, you get this um, dilation and for the blue sands, you get this, for the loose sands, you get this compaction. Um, these plots are also showing you the effect of this um, S parameter. Um, the S parameter uh, specifies the amount of additional softening. So if S equals zero, there's no additional softening. Um, if S equals one, you have maximum additional softening. So if you look at the blue curves on the top plot, you can see that for the S equals one parameter, you get a more brittle response. Um, and when S equals zero, you get a less brittle response. So you have the ability to tune the behavior of your North Sand model in this way. Um, the other thing that's attractive is that it's, it's relatively easy to calibrate um, from familiar soil properties, for example, CPT. Okay, the last new constitutive model that I'll talk about is, um, you probably haven't heard of it before because uh, we came up with this ourselves within Itasca. Um, the motivation for doing this was that we really needed a 3D liquefaction model. Um, there are, of course, some very popular models in 2D. UBC sand is an example, um, but there is no 3D version of the UBC sand. Um, there are, of course, some 3D liquefaction models out there, but we found them to be um, fairly difficult to use in practice. They were more research type tools. So um, we spent quite a lot of effort uh, working on this model. It was mostly um, Joe Cheng. So again, it's a 3D um, liquefaction type model. 
Uh, it's based on an existing model by Defalius and Manzari, um, but it's just been made uh, more sort of user-friendly for practitioners. Um, it uses relative density instead of void ratio, and it's, again, relatively easy to calibrate using um, known parameters such as blow count, like we're showing here on the, the left plot. This is just an example of using this model. Let's see if I get this movie to go. Um, this is a model of a, of a wharf. Um, I'm only showing half of the model here. We cut away half of it so you can see the inside. And we're plotting the, um, <clears throat> the maximum shear strain. Um, the, the model, you can see it's moving and deforming. The, the, the deformation is exaggerated a little bit just so you can see it more clearly. Um, and then the, the graph is showing the earthquake that is being applied to this model. So you can see that as a result of shaking, we get these, uh, these sort of shear bands forming. Um, and what we were really interested in in this model was the, the, uh, the behavior of this structure on top. So we've got a shell supported by some piles. And we wanted to see how stable that was going to be when, it, when an earthquake passed by in this type of soil. And this just shows, so if you run them, you can run the model multiple times, obviously. If you run it with different relative densities, um, you can see different results. So the right-hand plot is a high relative density and shows less deformation uh, than the left plot, which is a lower relative density. Okay. Uh, next thing on the what's new list, software integration. Um, so what I mean by that is integration um, of software, other Itasca software programs. So you're probably aware that we, there are other programs aside from FLAC 3D that we write and we sell. Um, two of those are 3DEC and PFC. So right now, if you buy FLAC 3D 7 and you load it up on your computer, you will automatically get 3DEC 7 and PFC 7 loaded up as well. So these codes are now all integrated into one program. Um, you still need a valid license to actually run them, uh, or at least to run large models. You can run them in demo mode right now if you want to within FLAC 3D7. And there are several reasons for doing this. I mean, one of the reasons is, is developer efficiency, and it makes things easier for us. Um, but the other reason is that we're hoping to uh, promote this sort of coupling between different um, solution methods. So for example, right now you can couple PFC balls with flag 3D zones and model sort of a discontinuum and continuum behavior all in the same model. And this is relatively easy with flag 3D7 because all these things are part of the same program. Um, here's just a fairly simple example showing that this wedge is made up of flag 3D zones and it's pushing down into a bunch of PFC particles and you can see the interaction here. The, the zones cause deformation of the particles, and the particles are actually applying a stress back on the zones. Um, so you can do these types of coupling problems right now fairly easily in FLAC 3D7. OK. User interface improvements. Um, aside from <laughs> more speed, um, one of the things we get asked a lot is, you know, I need to make, I need, I need it to be easier to build my models. So we spent some time on this too. Um, for those of you that have used Black 3D6, you will have um, seen the model pane. The model pane is a way to actually view the model and select things and manipulate things graphically with the mouse rather than with commands. Um, and so what I've got here is just a little demonstration showing you some of the new things in version seven. So we start with the extruder. Um, again, for those that don't know, you can build the model in 2D graphically, you know, by clicking the mouse and drawing things, or by importing a DXF. Um, you build up the model in a 2D view, and then you can extrude it to make a 3D model. So this is just showing the 2D view of that model, showing you how there are a couple of different layers in this model. Now we go to the side view. So what you can see is when we extrude it, we're going to get this number of zones in the in the in-plane direction. And again, we have um, more zones close to the region of interest and bigger zones away from the region of interest. 
So if you click on that extrude button, it thinks about it for a few seconds and then extrudes the model. And now your 2D model becomes a 3D model. Um, so this is a very easy way to build 3D models with simple geometries. Um, this is a model of half a tunnel. Um, and now we're looking at the model pane. And so now we can select things here and, and do things to them. And the things that you can do to them are um, increased in version 7. So what I'm doing now is I'm selecting all of the zones around the tunnel and in the tunnel. And I'm going to make them smaller because I want to have more detailed analysis around the tunnel. So I select them all. I go up here and I choose from a list of things I can do. And one of the things is densify. And so if I identify what it's going to do is take every one of those hexahedral zones and split it so that it becomes eight zones. So it's going to be two by two by two. And so in the region that I've selected, I've ended up with eight times as many zones. And now I can get a more detailed um, answer with respect to stresses and displacements here. Now I'm going to show how you can excavate part of this tunnel. So again, I'm just selecting the tunnel now. Um, and I can go up to that uh, widget where I can do things. And um, oh no, first of all, sorry. <laughs> first of all, I have to um, modify the position that I want to um, excavate. I don't want to excavate the whole tunnel at one time. I only want to do the first nine meters. So I choose a range. I limit it to the first nine meters. So now you can see that the selection is only the first nine meters. Now I can go up, choose from my menu and say, um, assign a constitutive model. So I could, in theory, change this to any one of the constitutive models that are built into FLAG3D. Um, the one that I want to choose is the null model, because I want to excavate this. So you can see the list here of all the constitutive models. And I choose null, and I hit assign. And then boom, it excavates the tunnel for you. This is all done without commands, although you can see the commands appearing down below here. So you could reproduce this if you wanted to. Now I can select, instead of zones, I can select zone faces. And I might want to do this if I want to put, for example, a liner um, on the tunnel surface. So I can select all of the zone faces like that, but maybe that's not what I want. Maybe I only want the, the top and the side. So I can change it so that it will select based on a break angle. And so you can see there's a break angle there between the bottom and the side. Um, and I can change it so I only select the top and the side. And now I can go up to my little tool and say, create a 2D structural element. And this will allow me to create a shell or a liner on that surface. Um, and also, if I want to give it a group name, which is what I'm doing here. Giving it a group name makes it easier in the future just to assign properties and do things to it. OK, so it's created the shells. Um, unfortunately, they're the same color as the background uh, faces, but they are there. And you can prove it to yourself by going up here and choosing shell and then selecting. And you can see now that I've selected all those shell elements. And I can go up and maybe change the group name for them if I wanted to. Um, one last thing to show before leaving this model pane is that um, we now have the ability to import um, 1D structural elements from a DXF. So if you want to import uh, bolts or um, soil nails or something like that, and you don't want to you know, write a bunch of fish to create them, you can draw them in AutoCAD or Rhino, um, import them into flag 3 d and it will just turn them into bolts for you. So this is totally useful. Um, I've just done that here. Now I'm going to plot, I imported them as piles, actually. I'm going to plot them. You can see just the ends of the piles there. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see. Um, so what we're going to do is hide some of the zones. So I select these zones. I right click. I say hide the selection. Now I can see the, the shells there and also the, the four poles on top. And again, if I select the zones um, at the face and hide those, and I can see those bolts that are into the face of the tunnel. And again, in the model pane, now that I can see them, um, I can select them. So I choose pile, and I select those ones on top. Um, and then I can do something like um, change the group name. And again, assigning a group name is useful, because then this allows you to 
easily identify them later for assigning properties or deleting them or whatever you want to do. So, okay, that's the model pane. Um, just some of the new things that um, we're doing to try and make your life easier with respect to building models and manipulating models. Um, I just showed, at the beginning of that, I showed the, uh, the 2D extruder, uh, where you can build a model in 2D and then extrude it to make a 3D model. Um, one of the things that has been added to this feature is the ability to create unstructured meshes. So it used to be that you had to divide up your model into four-sided shapes. You could fill them up with uh, quad zones. That is no longer the case. You can import any crazy geometry that you want. Um, and then just hit mesh and it will mesh it. And this just shows an example of some of those uh, crazy geometries that we can, we can mesh fairly easily now. We've also added uh, something called the geometry pane. Uh, this is a new pane that allows you to uh, import and visualize and manipulate um, geometries. And by geometries, I mean um, usually DXFs. So something you've gotten from the client that shows you the tunnel geometry or your pit geometry or something like that. And you might have a whole bunch of these. You might want to turn them on and off and visualize them in different ways. You might even want to modify them by um, deleting parts of them or extending parts of them. And you can do all of that now with the geometry pane. Okay, so that is most of what's new, um, I have a few miscellaneous items here uh, to talk about, and then I'll show the case study. Um, one of the miscellaneous items is, uh, hopefully you're still with me, because this is one of the things that we're really excited about. Um, starting today, basically, we are introducing web licenses. And what that is, is a license that does not require a key. Um, so up until now, you've required a USB key to plug into your computer to run the software. Um, you can now get a web license so that you don't need to use a USB key. You do need an internet connection so that it can check a database to see if you have a license. Um, but we have set it up so that it is intelligent and if you lose your internet connection, it doesn't crash the program, it just pauses and waits for the internet to come back. Um, this, is, this is really great for, especially for larger companies because you can have multiple users in multiple locations um, you don't have to pass the key back and forth. Anybody can use it at any location, um, just not necessarily at the same time. Also, these web licenses are self-managed, which means that uh, if you buy a web license, we make you the manager, and then you can add users, subtract users, look at how much it's being used, and these types of things. Um, so you have a lot of control over your own licenses. And then, of course, the, the, one of the main motivations for doing this was the ability to run Back3D in the cloud. Um, so obviously, you cannot take your USB key and go to Amazon and plug it into one of their servers. Um, but now with the web license, you can certainly fire up um, an AWS machine or a Microsoft Azure machine and run Back3D on the cloud. And we've been doing this quite a lot um, internally, and it works really well. Um, another thing we've added is compressed save files and results files. Um, you know, if you run very large models, you can end up with very large files clogging up your hard drive. Um, you can set it up now so that it automatically zips files when you hit save and automatically unzips files when you restore. Um, and this is potentially very useful. And just one more slide with some miscellaneous things on it. Um, We've enabled file backups. This is both projects and save files. So you can set it up so that these things are saved at regular intervals. Um, the save and restore operations are about twice as fast as they used to be. Uh, structural element nodes can have any number of links now, uh, which is useful. Um, I haven't talked much about it, but as well as fish scripting, we also have Python scripting. So if you like Python, or if you're used to Python, or you like the Python libraries, um, you can actually use Python instead of Fish. 
or as well as fish to do scripting in Flat 3D. Um, we've updated the, the built-in Python in Flat 3D to version 3 in, in Flat 3D 7. Uh, one other thing that we added just recently was this factor of safety contours. Um, so you probably know that you have the ability to run a factor of safety analysis in Flag 3D. Um, and up until now, it will run the analysis for you and then just spit out a number and tell you your factor of safety is 1.3 or something like that. Um, now you can actually plot these contours to show you um, sort of the different factors of safety in different regions. And this plot on the right here is an example of a real project done by one of our engineers for an open pit mine. He was looking at the stability of some of these benches and was able to use this um, plotting FOS contour option. Okay, so um, I've just got a couple of slides here showing some a real life problem that was done with Flag 3D7 just to show you some of the, how some of the new features might be used in, in, uh, in a real life problem. Um, this was a project up in North, Northern Minnesota near Duluth. Um, the, the, uh, the, the problem was to design the support system for a tall embankment on soft soil and minimize the amount of settlement. Um, so the engineer that, that did this, Augusto Lucarelli, um, he did it in two different ways. He used the pH model with the new small strain option that I talked about. And he also used the new soft soil model with the creep option. Um, the model had about 2 million zones in it, almost 100,000 structural elements, um, several stages of construction. And he was able to run the entire thing in, in less than a day. Um, I was able to run it overnight on my machine. And basically the whole thing ran overnight, which was which is great. And just shows some of the, the speed ups resulting in flat 3D7. This is what the model looks like. Um, it's a piece of roadway um, overlying a bunch of different uh, material layers. And again, this was almost 2 million zones. A whole lot of structural elements here. He had piles and these uh, CMC controlled modulus columns. Um, altogether, almost 100,000 um, structural elements. In the, in the constructed material, he had, he had rebars as well. Um, this is just a close-up plot showing one of the new features in version 7 that you can have these multiple links. Um, so he's got a, a shell element linked to a pile element, and that link also links to the surrounding soil. Um, and one thing he, he did was he wanted to customize the um, behavior of the structural elements. And so he did that using the new inline, sort of the new multi-threaded fish. Um, and so what he did was he, you know, every 50 steps, he would go and look at the, the bending moments and the um, axial forces and then modify the behavior of the, uh, the structural elements depending on uh, what the forces were in the element. And so he basically looped through all 100,000 uh, structural elements every 50 steps and did this modification. And so, um, you know, this was something that would have been quite slow in the past, but was reasonably quick now because of the multi-threading. This just shows uh, vertical displacements at the end of construction. Um, so the left plot is the pH model, and the right plot is the soft soil model. Now, this is the end of construction. So with the soft soil model, he then ran it forward in time to watch the creeping. Um, so he, they were, the client was interested in uh, what was going to happen over the next 30 years. And so he used the soft soil model with the creep option um, to look at the the displacements over the next 30 years. And then this is just a plot showing the axial forces and some of the structural elements, just so you can see what that looks like. Okay, that's the end of the, uh, the case study. And I've just got one more slide about um, what our plans are for the future. So. Now that we have the keyless licensing that I was talking about, um, we are working on more cloud computing options to make it easier for you to run Flag 3D in the cloud. Um, we're working on a 2D version of Flag 3D. So I'm sure you are aware that we already have a program called Flag that uh, you know runs 2D analysis, um, but it is 
quite different from Flex 3D. And moving between the two programs is a bit challenging. Um, and so what we're doing is making an actual version of Flex that is more similar to Flex 3D. And that will hopefully make your life easier in the future. Um, we're working on a cluster version. And by cluster, I mean a distributed memory cluster where you can potentially have hundreds of computing nodes. And this could lead to a significant speed up in, uh, in run times for people doing these very large models. Um, and as part of that, there will probably be a Linux version as well, because it is much easier to run um, Linux on a cluster. Uh, we're currently working on nonlinear structural elements. I, what I mean by that is liners and shells that can fail. We're working on implicit fluid and thermal calculations. Um, so the thermal and the implicit, sorry, the thermal and the fluid uh, calculations do lend themselves to implicit uh, solutions. And by doing this, we can get um, significant speed ups um, for the fluid and thermal parts of the calculation. We're working on a new type of dynamic damping. Um, for those of you that do dynamic analysis and use Rayleigh damping, you will know that the Rayleigh damping tends to reduce your time step and increase your run times. We're working on a new type of damping where that doesn't happen. And so you can get significant uh, speed ups. Um, we're working on a new module for Flex 3D called Mass Flow, which is going to be used for simulating cave mining. Um, and we're also working on a uh, a new constitutive model, mostly used for mining, um, but it's a very sophisticated advanced strain softening constitutive model. And uh, our plan is to have that out sometime this year. And there are a bunch of other things too that I don't have time to go into because um, we are now at 48 minutes. So thanks very much for joining. Um, there's a survey regarding features that you would like to see in FACT 3D that we are going to send out sometime after this webinar. Um, we really appreciate if you could respond to this. Uh, we really like to hear from users to find out what they want to see in the next version. Um, this is your chance to put your two cents in. Um, so it would be great if you could fill those out and send them back. Um, also, a recording of this webinar will be available um, fairly soon uh, after the end of this webinar. And uh, so you can get that and watch it again if you want to. Um, and that's all I'm going to say. So now I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, I'm putting this slide back up here so you can see the people who are potentially answering your questions. Um, so let's see if I can open up these questions here. Here we go. Bear with me for a second while I open up the question pane. All right. Let's start at the top. OK, can you share the presentation with us? Yes. Um, the recording will be available. And I'm sure it will be OK to make the, the PowerPoint available as well. I'll, I'll set that up and send something out. Um, I'm not necessarily going to answer all these questions. Again, we can follow up some of the more detailed ones by email. Um, can I use this program in contamination transport from surface to groundwater? Um, not really. I mean, you can do groundwater flow calculations. Um, we don't have contaminant transport type of logic in there where you can, you know, watch different uh, isotopes or so on propagating through the water. Um, we just have basic pore pressure calculations. We don't have contaminant transport in here. Um, all right. How to add acceleration time history at the top of the model? Um, that is definitely possible. You can add an acceleration time history to any point in the model. Um, we can follow up by email with that one um, to show you how to do it. Where will version five fall into that graph? That's a good question. I didn't. I only ran the comparisons between version six and version seven. Um, version six is also faster than version five. So if I put version five on there, it would be it would be even slower. Um, that would be an interesting exercise to do, but Definitely, definitely version six was faster than five, and version seven is faster than six. So um, if you're going straight from five to seven, you will see very significant speed ups. Is the scripting language still fish? Are the commands retro compatible? Yes, it's still fish. Um, 
the fish functions are exactly the same in version six and version seven, they are different from version five. Um, when we went to version six, we did a, an overhaul of the commands in the fish and, and changed all the syntax. So the, um, the fish is different if you're coming from version five. However, there is a conversion utility that allows you to convert your old fish into new fish, and it should run in version seven. Um, and then as mentioned, of course, if you prefer, you can actually use Python now. That's something that's new in version six and seven. Um, I'm, I'm answering these questions here, but David and, and Joe, if you guys want to jump in at any point, feel free. Um, regarding the mesh, is it generated automatically? Um, that's a good question. In, in general, not, in general, not really. Um, in general, you can build up a mesh uh, with primitives. You can build a mesh um, fairly easily in the 2D extruder, like I showed you. In that case, you can get it to generate automatically and then extrude it. Um, you can build up a mesh with something called building blocks, which I didn't talk about, but it's essentially like Lego, where you can put pieces together. Um, there actually is a facility in Fact3D to build a mesh automatically from a geometry. So if you import a DXF, um, you could build a mesh and just say, you know, fill up this geometry with the mesh and it will do it. Um, it's not very sophisticated. There are not a lot of options there. Uh, you can do it, but really, if you want to do that kind of meshing, you're better off to use the Griddle program that we sell. And that has a lot of sophisticated options for sort of automatically generating meshes from geometries. Um, so yeah, if you have complicated geometries and you just want to automatically mesh them, I would recommend using the Griddle program. Oh, and then the next question, if I create my mesh in Griddle and export flat 3D mesh, does it automatically implement the attached logic in areas of different zone sizes? Dave Russell, do you know the answer to that one? Um, the attached logic is never done automatically and because it's too hard to tell what you mean to attach and what you don't for cases like interfaces and excavation. But there is a command, you, you there's a single command zone attached by face that will basically attach everything it can find. So as long as you emit that command before you solve, you should be fine. Um, why don't you stay on the line here, Dave? Because the next question is, in FLAC3D, how does the fish compare to Python in terms of speed? Um, that's a complex question. Uh, and I don't have a lot of very specific comparison metrics. Um, in general, the choices which you're more familiar with, because it's dominated by you know, what you, how long it takes to figure out how to write the function you want. But if your primary interest is speed during cycling, then a fish operator is almost certainly going to be the fastest thing available. Um, Python has a lot of power and flexibility, but is sort of famously not compatible with true multi-threading. So that's my answer there. Um, OK. How can I import a mesh into FLAC? How's the data structure format in order to make my code the same import mesh into FLAC 3D? OK, there is a, there is a very well-defined format for uh, meshes in FLAC 3D. Um, it is certainly possible to import um, from different programs. Um, yeah, it's all it's all there in the manual. It's it's relatively easy to just to point out. We specifically support both the uh, Ansys file file formats and Abacus file formats. So if you have a third party meshing tool that will export to either of those, you can import it in Flat 3D directly. There you go. Fantastic. <clears throat> um, what tools do you use to prepare the grids that represent the model geometry? Yeah, so this is what I was saying before. You have the, the 2D extruder. We have the primitives, which is just um, you know building up different shapes. We have the building blocks, um, which is a fairly sophisticated graphical way of building up models by putting blocks together and manipulating them. Um, like I said, there is, there is the ability to generate a mesh automatically from a geometry. But if you do have very complicated geometries and you want to um, automatically generate a mesh, you're better off probably using Griddle. 
In fact, 3D7, can you write user-defined constitutive models in Python and not C++? I think the answer to that is no. Do you want to say anything about that, Joe? <laughs> no, you can you you can you can write your own uh, user-defined model in uh, C, not Python, right now. Yeah, we have. I, that I will problem. say that while it's not, it hasn't been done yet. Now that we have multi-threaded fish, we have. Uh, we are serious considering adding um, the ability to write considered models in Fish, uh, but not Python. Python, it would be too slow because of the multi-threaded problem. But um, it is a thing we could do in Fish. We just haven't done it yet. Um, okay, thanks. Next question. I'm currently modeling a centrifuge model of a pile-supported wharf, which is similar to the one in the example you showed. Um, how can I get access to the code for the example? pile support dwarf. I think that should be fine. Joe, I think that wasn't like a real project or anything, right? We should be able to share that. Is that right? Uh, yes, no problem. Yeah, okay. So we can send that out afterwards. Um, all right, there's a very long one that I will um, answer maybe by email later. <laughs> Have you thought in an offshore foundation module where the failure mechanisms are different? Pile design software has developed modules for this area. Uh, okay, I think some of these we're just going to follow up by email. They're fairly detailed. Um, about the web license, what happened if I don't connect to the internet? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you need to connect to the internet. You need to be connected to the internet to use the web license. It will check that you have a valid license before it does cycling or model modification. Um, like I said, if the internet connection drops, um, the program will not crash. It will just stop running until the internet connection comes back and then continue on. Um, there are certain operations you can do without a license. So if you already have a model finished and you just want to look at it, you don't need a license for that. You can just look at it. Um, and so it is possible to do some things without a license, but um, you know, if you want to cycle or if you want to modify the model, you will have to be connected to the internet. Uh, next question, similar. My internet, my my connection is intermittent and drops. Um, what happens with the keyless license? Um, how frequently does the software scan the internet for a license? Dave Russell, what's the answer to that one? Um, I actually don't. I don't remember the specific number. It's on the order of every thirty seconds. Um, um, after you after you claim it, and if it loses the connection and it can't reestablish it, because that's the first thing it attempts to do automatically, it just throws up a dialog and waits. Um, and as soon as it makes the connection again, you can you will continue whether you're doing cycling or model creation. So it, if you have an intermittent connection, the worst that will happen is it'll pa pause every once in a while, but it should come back as soon as your connection reappears. Okay, next question. Is two-phase flow option implemented in new version similar to FLAC? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, it is something that we're thinking about, but yeah, the short answer is that is not in there. Next question. Is there any tutorial for running FLAC 3D on the cloud, such as using AWS? Um, that is a good question. Um, you know, the keyless licensing just became available today. <laughs> so, um, you know, another, and the next priority for us is to, to tell people how do they can run these things on the cloud. Um, we haven't done that yet. Um, we do plan on coming up with some sort of tutorial about how you can go about doing that. Um, so the short answer is not yet. Can I switch my USB key license to a web license? Yes, you can. There is a, a fee associated with that. Um, but yes, you can definitely do that. Which tool did you use for mesh generation in the open pit example? Um, for that example, I just um, built it in what we call this octree method. So um, you, you import a geometry, like say the, the geometry of the pit, um, and then you densify the zones around that pit. And so what you end up with is this sort of stair step pattern of zones that um, look reasonably close to an open pit, but not exactly like an open pit. Um, so you have very dense zones close to the geometry and then coarser zones away from the geometry. So this was all done within FLAC 3D, and we didn't use Griddle or anything like that. Um, you can do that using um, Densify in clever ways. 
um, to get these sort of octree meshes. Other question, exists a new version, the option of built a thrust axial diagram. I don't, I don't think there is. Is that right, Dave? We don't have those, those moment thrust diagrams in Black 3D, is that right? No, it's not a built-in plotting option yet. It's been on our list of things to do for a long time, but we haven't quite got to it. I mean, people do it, but they have to do it custom, so. Yeah, I, I think the plot that I showed from Augusto, he did it by hand somehow. <laughs> Do you think that you can include implicit calculation in version eight? That sounds attractive. So the plan is that there will be implicit calculations for fluid and thermal. Those types of diffusion equations lend themselves to implicit calculations. Um, there is no plan to have implicit uh, mechanical. Again, the, the mechanical is generally highly nonlinear or dynamic or something else complicated. It doesn't necessarily lend itself to implicit. Um, now. It's potentially something we could do in the future, but it almost certainly won't make it into version eight. Um, but there will be implicit thermal and fluid calculations. Can I, I just want to make a small clarification. Go ahead. Like, um, five, six, and seven all had implicit thermal and fluid calculations. It's just that the implicit method we were using had a, a problem with the radius of convergence. So the new implicit methods we have uh, will allow a much larger effective time step. Um, but they do have implicit fluid and thermal. The other thing we plan to do before version eight is allow um, some method of doing unsaturated flow implicitly, which you currently can't do. Yes. Okay, next question. Um, are you planning to run any online training sessions? That's a great question. And we, we're definitely planning on it, but we haven't got around to doing it yet. Um, um, you know, especially with the virus and everything, it's something that we definitely want to do. Um, and so the short answer is yes, we're planning on it, but um, not in the very near future because we're not quite quite there yet. Next question: Can you elaborate on your mass flow simulator? What is it? Um, well, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that, but um, this is a, essentially a way of modeling um, cave mining based on um, PFC type behavior. So the sort of the, the physics are kind of based on running a bunch of particle models and seeing how they behave. Um, but it's a little bit more empirical than that so that it can run a lot faster. Um, so that you can run these cave scale, you know, you can really run a cave scale model in PFC, it would take forever. Um, so we just sort of took some of the ideas from PFC and and uh, sp spun it a little bit so that you can you can build a cave scale model and simulate these things um, caving and bulking and so on. Um, the details of how that is all done, I don't know. Uh, maybe we can follow up with an email. Um, but essentially, the, the plan is it's going to be a, uh, a separate program that allows you to run these types of simulations, but can also be easily coupled to Flag 3D. Um, how can you input core pressures obtained in a different software? Um, I know that we were working on something where you could import core pressures and do interpolation automatically. Is that, is that what did we actually finish that, Dave Russell, or no? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? The question was, how can you import core pressures obtained in a different software? Um, oh, well, there's a, a couple of different ways to do it. Um, the easiest way is we have a uh, we don't have a built-in file format for that, although it's a, it's a very simple thing to write in Fish right now. We do have a mode that was it's called zone-based core pressures, which was introduced specifically for tough coupling. If you're familiar with that software, but um, that allows you to 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 easily write something that imports core pressures on the zone basis instead of grid point, and then apply it to the model. Um, we are looking at providing um, more uh, automatic tough coupling in the near future since we've developed it twice right now for specific applications, so um, providing it to the customers. But other than that, we don't have anything specifically built in. So, I, I, I recall talking about some sort of scheme where you could import core pressures at points and, and it does some sort of interpolation. To, to put them at the grid points. Was that something we were just doing in Python or was that something we were gonna build in? I can't remember. Um, I 
it's not built in. It was probably yeah, okay. with Python for a specific problem. <laughs> so. Um, can you explain a bit about how to export DXF file and meshing in Fact3D? Uh, I think we talked about that already. We can follow up specifically there. Um, are you planning to schedule a Fact3D or 2D software training this year? Um, we just did it. So we generally do our training sessions in the spring, so March or April. Um, again, hopefully we can do some online training at some point, but in general, we usually just do the in-person training in the spring. Um, having said that, we are planning on doing a, a dynamics training in the fall. So that would be specifically related to dynamics and earthquake modeling and stuff like that. Um, so the current plan is to do that in October. We'll see how it works out with the virus and everything. Um, two different questions here about how to learn fish commands. Um, I'm not sure what to say about that, except that you can go through the manual and uh, follow along in the simple examples. Um, it, it has also been our plan to put on some like YouTube videos about getting started with fish, which we haven't quite got to yet, but um, that, is, that is a plan for the future. Are there any options to model discrete fibers in the soil, short fibers that are randomly oriented within the soil? That's an interesting question. I don't know, Dave or Joe, do you want to comment on that? I'm going to defer to Joe on this one. Could you could you repeat that question? I, I didn't sure. catch. Yeah, the question was, are there any options to model discrete fibers in the soil, short fibers that are randomly oriented within the soil? Uh, I'm not I'm not sure currently. And could you follow up our our I'll send you a email for the detail about this? Yeah, we'll follow up with that one. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the validation of the support elements. Well, there's I think there's quite a lot of uh, verification problems in the manual that show you the behavior of the support elements and how they behave and match analytical solutions. So I think it's all in the manual. Um, is there any future plan for advancement in hybrid modeling approach? For example, flag 3D and PFC. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like I said, that is something that we are um, working on. Uh, improving the coupling between flag 3D and PFC is definitely something that, um, that we want to do in the future. Um, like I said, you can already do that to some extent, and we're just going to keep on working on that to make it easier and, and faster and better. Um, does Itasca have a plan to implement a laboratory tool? I'm not sure exactly what that means. Maybe we can follow up on that one. Uh, GeoGrid effect is not showing in displacement mode. Okay, I'm not sure what that means either. We can follow up on that one. Uh, here's one for Joe. PM4 silt model is available in Slack 3D version 7. I'm not familiar with that model. Joe, do you know anything about it? Uh, this model was developed by the University of California at Davis and two professors. And currently, they only have the 2D uh, model for uh, for flag. So I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure they have any plan for 3D. So basically, this is a user-defined model. So any questions or technical support, you should directly go to uh, these original uh, developers. So it has got to not provide support for user-defined models. OK, thanks. Um, can this version model cracks? Um, yeah, that's, that's also a question that's hard to answer. And we'll maybe follow up on that one to get more details. Could the implicit flow solution be used coupled with the mechanical solution? Um, I think the answer, maybe Dave Russell can speak more to that, but I think my answer would be that it can be loosely coupled and that you would you would run some amount of time implicit and then run mechanical and then run some amount of time implicit and then run mechanical. Is that the way you see it working, Dave? That, that's typically how it's done. It can be run fully coupled where you just take one fluid because the time the, the the time scales are decoupled. So and, and there is no time scale in the static mechanical analysis. So you could do full coupling where you take one fluid step along with one static mechanical step. But more typically, 
um, you do it with a loosely coupled, um, either decoupled or loosely coupled. Loosely coupled means you take a fluid step and then psychomechanical equilibrium after every fluid step. Okay. Next question, flag 3D7 cost. Um, the cost depends on where you are in the world somewhat. Um, we have different agents in different regions, so you just have to contact your local agent and I'll send you a quote. Next question, similar. Um, is it free for students? That's actually a good question. Um, for academics, the cost is 50%. So there's a 50% discount for academics. Um, but we do have different education type programs to make it easier to get the software. So uh, one is the Itasca Education Program Research. And so you could submit a research idea to us and we can assign you a mentor and give you the software for free um, so you can work on your research project. Um, it's sort of competitive, so it's not guaranteed that you would get it, but if, if you submit a proposal, then we'll look at it. Um, and then the other thing we are offering is um, if your university buys one copy of the software, then we'll give you 10 free copies so you can use it for teaching or whatever you want. Um, so if you go to the web page and look under education, you can see the different things there. Is there a possibility to see the factor of safety of all zones in the model? Um, yeah, I assume so. When you do that contour, it basically gives you the factor of safety of all the zones. Most people modify the contours so that you don't see all the ones that are really high because you don't care about those ones. But yes, you can. Uh, another question about. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Jump in. Uh, about that fact. So there, there's two different things. There's a factor of safety contour, which is actually a velocity, velocity bait based on the regions that are unstable at any given factor of safety. But there's another plot you can make at any time in any model, which is the uh, strength to stress ratio plot mm. that will tell you, you know, how close any given zone is to the failure surface just as a static result. So, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, next two questions are asking about uh, video lectures or webinars for beginners. Um, Again, that's something that's definitely on our list. There are there are some out there, like there's a getting started tutorial. You can just look it up on YouTube or on our website and a few other uh, videos for, for doing certain things. Um, certainly, you should look at the getting started tutorial, um, which is very helpful. And then, yeah, we plan to do a lot more of those types of things. In the coupling of FLAC and PFC, is it possible to model landslides in which solid fluid CFD and FLAC Thanks for the webinar. Um, I'm going to defer answering that one because the, the fluid coupling is pretty challenging in PFC. Um, I'll get one of the PFC guys to follow up with that one. Where can I find documentation to modify the fish codes in version 5 so that they can be run in version 6? Um, it's in there somewhere. Dave Russell, do you want to answer that one? Uh, the documentation is in the edit menu, there's a specific option that's basically a data file conversion tool. So if you load up a data of Flacker D5 data file in Flacker D7, you can go to the edit menu in the text editor and select convert, and it will automatically do its best to convert it from five to seven. And then highlight in orange any place where it couldn't do it automatically, but it will give you prompts about what you should do to fix it. So. There's, there's also um, documents in the documentation that is like a mapping. So it shows you what the old commands are and what the new commands are. So if you wanted to do, you know, do it by hand, you could do that as well. Um, that's really useful. What is the difference between FLAC and the new FLAC 2D? Um, yeah, like I said, the new FLAC 2D is basically a 2D version of FLAC 2D. So it's going to have the same sort of plotting and the same sort of editor. Um, you know, the capabilities won't be that different from the old FLAC, but it's more the look and feel are going to be the same as FLAC 3D. Um, and possibly not all of the FLAC features will make it into FLAC 2D, at least initially. I mean, it is our plan that that will eventually happen, but um, there may be a few things missing when the FLAC 2D first comes out. But yeah, the main, the main difference is going to be the, the look and feel so that it's more like FLAC 3D. Uh, the new version can stimulate the jointed rock mass explicitly and implicitly. Sure, implicitly we have the um, ubiquitous joint model, so you could you could put in 
um, you can put in a constitutive model that behaves as if there was a whole bunch of joints in it. Um, and you could, of course, actually put the joints in explicitly using the interfaces, like I showed in that one plot. Um, it sort of depends on how many interfaces you want to put in. You know, if it's um, 10, 20, 30 interfaces, that's probably okay. If it's thousands of interfaces, then you probably want to go to 3DEC or some other program. Um, okay, this is still going. <laughs> Could you please explain more about energy damping, especially coupling PFC and Flag 3D? Um, okay, I think maybe we'll follow that one up with, by email because that's pretty technical. Um, how to apply free field if there's a tunnel at the boundary? Okay, we'll follow up with that one too. Is this software able to analyze the impact of geochemical reactions to soil and structural elements? Um, I would say not directly. I mean, we don't have any chemistry in there. You can do whatever you want with fish or with Python if you know what the, what the chemistry is and what the physics is, but um, there's nothing in there directly related to um, chemistry. Uh, okay, some of these. I'll follow up later. Um, when will version eight come out? Is it worth purchasing version seven? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, version seven just came out in this, you know, less than it. Uh, when was it? July, maybe? July or August? Um, so there will probably not be in a version eight for, I don't know, a year and a half, two years. Um, so I would definitely consider purchasing version seven. <laughs> Um, do presented constitutive models more reliable to slope behavior than previous one? Um, okay, I don't know. We'll have to follow up on that one. Can I conduct large deformation analysis like CPP penetration? Um, the short answer is yes. You can turn on large strain and you can get very large deformations. Um, there is a limit. You can reach a point where the zones get so deformed that they uh, the volume goes to zero and then you can't do the calculation anymore. But um, for reasonably large strains, yeah, you can do it. Um, is V7 more user friendly? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, I, I was trying to show some of the new features in the model pane, um, in the geometry pane, and so on. That you can do more things uh, graphically, it does make it a little bit easier. Um, another question about crack propagation modeling. We'll follow up with that one. Can this program solve problems in discontinuous bodies like fractured rock mass? Um, again, there's two ways you could do it. I mean, you could do it with the constitutive model that behaves like a discontinuous fractured rock mass. So you can set your properties so that it behaves like a, like a fractured rock mass. Um, you could, in theory, put in a whole bunch of interfaces, but that's not really the intention of Flag 3D. If you want to do something like that, you probably want to buy 3DEC <coughs> or even PFC. Um, can hydraulic fracturing simulation now be simulated using pre-existing fractures, using DFNs? Um, I, I'll, I'll give my answer. Maybe Dave can check in. I, I would say not really. I mean, we don't have flow in the fractures like we do in 3DEC. Um, so you can't really directly do hydraulic fracture simulations considering the existing fractures. I don't know if you want to add to that, Dave. Uh, no, I think that's pretty true. Doing um, um, joint flow in Flag 3D with it, any, anything other than a small number of fractures, it's quite difficult right now. You, you should use 3DEC or PFC. Um, it's something we're looking at, but right now Flag 3D is not really the tool for that. When you refine the mesh in a zone, do you need to manually adjust the mesh in adjacent coarser zone? Uh, the answer to that is no. That was the, the point of that slide showing the attaches. Um, you can densify zones, and then you can attach them to the zones next to them. And it, the grid points don't necessarily have to match up. So the short answer is no. You don't have to mess around with that. <laughs> Luigi, the current help is a little cumbersome to use. Is it possible to revert back to the old help format? 
standard Windows help. Um, my understanding is that the standard Windows help system is not even supported by Microsoft anymore. So I think the short answer there is no. Anything you want to add there, Dave? <laughs> I mean, no, that, that's basically the problem. Even Microsoft apps don't use Windows compiled help files anymore. We, we, we had to basically drop it due to lack of, lack of support and lack of features, things like search and other things where it was just becoming too difficult to deal with. So we're doing what even Office does at this point, which is just use straight up each HTML and, and do a web access. So if you don't like it, a number of people aren't happy about it appearing in the panel, but you can change that and have it appear in the browser or pick one or one or both, depending on the context. Um, but I think the the help is going to be an HTML form for the foreseeable future. Um, and another advantage of it is that very soon now it should be appearing on our website, so that you can um, decouple from the code completely. And it will be able, it will be available to everybody all the time. Uh, okay. Some of these we've already answered. Um, is there a possibility for a bad geometry problem in the R-square analysis? Yes. As I said, you can reach a point where the zones are basically collapsed and you can't cut it anymore. So that is possible. Can we import geometry and mesh from other software like Abacus? Yes, you can. Abacus and Ansys, is that right, Dave? Yeah, um, right now in our format, Abacus and Ansys formats. Can I create a node at a specific point and apply a force in that node if the mesh model geometry is already constructed? Um, I don't I don't think you can just add a node to an already constructed mesh. Um, although I do think you can apply a point load. Is that true? <clears throat> okay. You can follow up on that one. Um, is it possible to export the mesh and results in BDK format? Good question, because it's something we're just working on right now. Um, so the short answer is not right now, but soon. <clears throat> is there a reference to this where a video and you can get Uber and if you there to get you started? Uh, and we are working on adding more, but there are some, there are definitely some there right now. Testing. Testing. Oh, I hear you. Sorry, my mic stopped working. Anyway, I'll, I'll let you continue, but I can come back for any questions you have, so. Um, all right, Luigi again, can you generate zones inside a closed volume wireframe if you bring the DXF in fact 2D? The answer is, again, yes, you can. Um, your options are limited and it's not very sophisticated, but in theory, you can create a mesh for a closed DXF, yes. Uh, is there any provision for a CPD, C PDH certificate for, to the participants for attending the webinar? I don't think so. I'm not sure that the webinar was that educational in terms of actual engineering, um, so probably not. Is it possible to make coupling with an older PFC 3D? Uh, I think the answer to that is no. Um, here's a good question. This one's for Dave. Can you guys briefly explain how you achieve less computing time? Does it have to do with less code lines? I guess the numerical method is still intact. Um, can you hear me? Is this okay? Uh, um, I would say that most of the speed benefit from six to seven was due to um, modifying the algorithms to reduce the memory bandwidth overhead. On modern CPU architectures with many cores, the limit is not flops per second and hasn't been for some years. The limit is how fast you can get all that memory to the CPU and back. You're limited by the main memory bus. So if you can go back and look at your algorithms and the way you store data in such a way that you reduce that memory bandwidth, you can contain significant speed ups in practice on systems with a large number of cores. And so that is responsible for most of the speed benefit we did. 
Okay, thanks. Um, here's another one for you, Dave. You stay on the line. Are interfaces purely incremental, or is it necessary to initialize the small displacements like in previous versions? Interfaces are not incremental, and I'm very unhappy about that. Um, so <laughs> it, it, it is a, it is a has been a thorn in my side and everyone's side for years and years. Um, we are act, actually actively developing now a replacement. Um, so either an entirely new form of interface will show up in a, uh, a new version of Flack 3D, or we will reformulate the interfaces to be incremental. One of the two things is going to happen in the next couple of years. But right now, they remain based on absolute penetration. So. OK, I understand meshing for irregular geometry is a new feature. However, the elements are still four-noded throughout the model, or it adjusts to three-noded at required locations in the model. Um, yes, you can do this automatic meshing from a DXF, and there are different options. You can choose quad dominant, which it tries to fill up the region with hexahedral elements. Um, but if it can't, it will sneak in some other shapes. Um, or you can just choose the whole thing to be tetrahedral elements. Um, this is fairly robust because you can mesh anything with tets. Um, but of course, the tet elements don't work as well in plasticity. Um, so the answer to that is, yeah, it, it could potentially adjust itself to throw in different types of elements. Do you have any plan to embed Griddle into Flag 3D? Um, it's a good question. I mean, Griddle functionality is gradually moving into Flag 3D, like for example, the ability to create a mesh from a DXF. Um, however, a lot of the uh, advantages of Griddle have to do with, with Rhino and the plugins for Rhino that allow you to manipulate meshes and do intersections and complicated things like that. So those types of functionalities, we will probably not put in Flag 3D. We're not gonna spend time trying to rewrite Rhino, um, but certainly some of the functionality is gradually creeping into Flag 3D. Does Itasca have a plan to implement a laboratory tool like a soil test tool? So there's clarification of the previous question. Um, yeah, actually, that's something we've been working on, but we haven't actually released it yet. Anything to say about that, Dave? Uh, no, other than that, this is one of those projects we've had for a couple of years, sort of on the back burner when we've had spare time, and we just haven't had much spare time in the past <laughs> many months. So there is, there is, we call it Flack Lab. There's a sort of very, very alpha version sitting around um, waiting to be worked on. And once we have time or a, or a new person or somebody to work on it, we, we plan on resurrecting it. But right now, it's not it's not an active development at this precise second. So. OK. Is it possible to create a model in 3DEC and run it in FLAC 3D with joints from 3DEC as interfaces? Great question, because that's something we've just been working on. Um, so the new 3DEC 7 will have this ability to create a 3DEC model and export it to Flex 3D. So the zones become zones and the joints in 3DEC become interfaces in Flex 3D. Um, it's still very much in the testing phase, um, but in preliminary tests shows that it actually works pretty well. Um, so the short answer is yes, it will be possible, um, but we don't know for sure if it will work for every complicated situation. <laughs> Is it compulsory to know fish language to work with Flag 3D? The answer to that is no. Um, we've tried to uh, write the examples and so on to use not so much fish. Um, so it's definitely possible to create models and run models without using any fish at all. Um, because we recognize that some people don't like using fish. So we're trying to make it easier to do these things without any fish at all. Um, so the short answer is no, you don't need to know fish to run Flag 3D. Is it easy to learn fish? Um, you know, fish was, was designed to be relatively easy. Um, you know, it was designed for engineers, not necessarily programmers. Um, from my point of view, I would say it's, it's easy to learn. Um, it's fairly intuitive. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's still, it's still programming, so it does take a little bit of effort, but I would say that it's definitely easier than, you know, Fortran or C++ or something like that. <clears throat> Uh, another question about PM4 silt model. Um, 
please shed a bit more light on the new strain softening model for mining applications. Um, I'm going to let Joe handle that one. If you want to talk a little bit more about IMAS model, maybe. Oh. Still here. <laughs> uh, IMAS model is is a is a strain softening model where where we are now in development, and this model maybe need a, a optional license to use because this this is very useful for mining such as caving, uh, rock slopeability and uh, pillar simulations and uh, details are all in preparation so if you could follow up and then even maybe we could add some more details but not currently is not maybe it's not a good time because there's so many many things to say yeah yeah good, good answer we'll follow up on that one because there's a lot of a lot of detail there when running two models on the same key the time and speed will be affected yes of course because everything is multi-threaded so um, if you're running two models at the same time each model is only using half of the threads, so um, you know those two, two models will obviously run slower than if you just run one model by itself. Um, okay, some of these we've already answered. Um, how does Flak 3D compare to other FEM-based softwares like Plexus, RS3, Midas? Um, give some advantages of using Flag 3D as compared to others. <laughs> Please discuss. Um, well, this is a huge topic, but um, you know, I would say maybe Dave can answer after me. But I would say, you know, some of the main advantages of Flag 3D are that it is um, customizable. I mean, the fact that we have the fish language makes it possible to do all kinds of crazy things. And people generally use Flag 3D when they're doing complicated things. Um, RS3 is a great program, but you know, you're fairly limited as to what you can do because um, you have to do everything through the interface. Um, Flag 3D is a lot of sophisticated things in it that other programs don't have. Um, the dynamic analysis is a big selling point. Um, it's not easy or even possible to do dynamic analysis in some of these other programs. Um, similarly, thermal analysis. Um, Dave Russell, do you want to continue on? Um, so I would say, yeah, I mean, to my mind, and you could go on about this for a long time, but I would, I would stress two things. Um, the first is that um, when you're using FLAC 3D, it's because you're looking at um, nonlinear path dependent material behavior, and which is almost all of geomechanics. And even a simple Mohr Coulomb model is highly path dependent. And when you're using a path dependent material behavior, it's all about the path. And FLAC 3D um, solution procedure is designed to follow as realistic a path as possible while still you know reaching static equilibrium in a reasonable amount of time so i would that that's my first assertion my uh second one is that um very much our philosophy at itasca and all our codes is to not put you in a box so you're not restricted by the code features we go to great length while well, we put things in to make it easy to do the standard things as much as we can and even higher priority is to put in low level features and connections and fish so that for your special case and every model has its own special cases you have the ability to put in what you need to make that model work according to your understanding of what's important so those are the two things i would stress at the highest level that's a good point. I think all of the programs that this person mentioned, Plexus, Rock Science, and Midas are all using implicit approach, and we're using explicit approach, which again is is potentially better for these highly nonlinear problems. Uh, how can I convert my physical license to a web license? That is definitely possible. Just contact your local agent, and they can sort it out for you. Uh, when generating the grid, is it possible to select the zone type? Again, it, it depends on what method you're using to generate the grid, so uh, we can follow up on that one. Uh, is it possible to import a particle in PFC? I think the answer to that is yes. I don't know if the PFC experts are here, but I'm pretty sure you can import. You can definitely import uh, the rigid blocks into PFC. Um, and I'm not 100% sure you can import particles, but maybe. Obviously, you can do anything with fish, so. If you could figure out a file format, you could just read them in. 
Uh, is the coupling of 3DEC and FLAC 3D mature at present? The answer to that is no. I mean, the, the, like I said, the FLAC 3D will load up, sorry, 3DEC will load up with FLAC 3D, um, but we haven't actually put in any of the, the coupling between 3DEC and FLAC 3D at the moment. Um, you could, in theory, couple them with FISH because they're both, both there and they're both running. Um, but there's nothing, nothing built in. So the answer is no, it's not really mature at present. Uh, okay. Will you still support USB key licensing in the future? Yes, of course. We're going to keep that forever because there are some people that um, you know, can't connect to the internet for whatever reason um, and just prefer the USB. Um, all right. All right. I'm not sure that what this is. We'll have to follow up with that one. Um, when travel overseas, internet speed and bandwidth are limited. Will web license consume a lot of data usage? No, it's very minimal data usage. It just does a query once in a while to make sure that you have a license. Um, how does Flag 2D handle intersecting interfaces? Do you want to answer that one, Dave Russell? <laughs> okay. Um, can you hear yeah, Okay. I'm sorry. I need to check every time. Make sure my microphone's working. The <laughs> the uh, Flag 3D uh, handles past versions of Flag 3D had a lot of trouble with intersecting interfaces. In Flag 3D7, that is still an issue, although much much less of one. Provided you started out with a well-formed mesh, which is pretty typical now, and um, that it's a small strain problem. Intersecting interfaces aren't a problem at all. There is still a potential it, potential issue um, if you're doing intersecting interfaces and large strain, and you expect those interfaces to move significantly in large strain. Um, I haven't seen that for a while in practice, but it still is a potential problem. It's one of the things we are, are uh, uh, attempting to solve with the new formulations being worked on right now. Okay, next question for Joe. Can you add the NGI ADP constitutive model? I'm not familiar with that one. I assume it's Norwegian something. Yeah. <laughs> any any custom model you you wish to be a building model or you uh the you uh user defined model, you no, know, just send us the uh, you know the detail formulation or verification or validation to us, and then we where decide if, if if it's a good model, definitely of yeah, of course we could do, but we will review that model first. Yeah. yeah, and it's also worth mentioning that anybody can implement a their own constitutive model with the, the C option. Um, and then it becomes a plugin and it runs fast. So um, you could do that. Is it possible to group zones after creating zones? Yes, of course. That's a big part of Black 3D, having zone groups. Um, all right, here's a detailed question about mixed discretization. We'll follow with that one. Um, oh, what about remeshing? Any plan to provide remeshing capability with Flag 3D? There's a good one for Dave Russell. Um, okay, so what I'll, what I'll say here is that is that that's not an immediate development, but we do have it's it is like our on our big five list, like our big five features we'd like to add in the future and. There are actually a number of different approaches we'd like to take with that um, to try and minimize the perturbation that happens to a model when you're forced to remesh it because of large strain. So this is sort of a, a researchy thing for us, um, not so much to do it, but to do it in the in the in the most physically accurate way possible. So I wouldn't expect it in eight, um, but maybe soon thereafter. Okay, how about adding a user Q&A forum to ask for support and share experience of the users? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I would recommend that you go to LinkedIn and join the Itasca group. Uh, people are generally using that as a sort of a forum for questions about Itasca software. Um, we don't necessarily want to support a forum by ourselves on our own website, um, partially because there's effort in doing that and also partially because um, we end up getting a lot of support questions through the forum when we would rather receive them as actual support questions. Um, but that sort of forum does exist on LinkedIn, 
uh, just join the Itasca group and people do post things on there and people do answer questions there. Could you also simulate fiberglass bolts? That's a good question. I mean, I guess it depends on what the properties are and whether we could make the existing bolt formulation behave like fiberglass. I don't know much about that. Any comments, Dave? Um, I'm sorry, that was fiberglass bolts? Is that, was that yeah. the question? Yeah. But what about them? Well, could you, could you simulate them? I mean, I assume if you could figure oh, out yeah. what the sure. properties are. Then. Four holes and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, it's done. Um, fairly typically, uh, as several projects. Um, if, I, if, if I'm understanding what that means correctly, which I might not be, um, uh, the the issue there is the there's a big difference in stiffness, um, which is a thing you have to be aware of and plan for. But yeah, people do it. I've seen Augusta do it a lot. All right, you stay on because there's two more questions about structural elements. Um, how would the metallic arches and struts in the tunnel be modeled? Um, so we're veering into the area of practical application where yeah. um, you might be better off actually talking to a, 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 a consultant user rather than a developer. But my under, there's a couple of different ways to do it. One way is to add, uh, if I understand what this is, is a, uh, for instance, a 1D beam element that runs along the ridge that reinforces the liner that's attached to the liner. Um, that's the first thing that comes to mind. But um, I think that really this would be better answered by one of our civil engineers who have more practical experience with something like this. Oh, uh, Augusto's here. He can jump in if Jim unmutes me. So if you can find oh. him, <laughs> he's online. So, <laughs> I don't know if you can find him, but he's not on the organizer list. So he, he just sent me a, a, a immediate message. So. Wow, OK. <laughs> I don't know. There's still 207 people. You might not not be able to find him, but um. oh, it's alphabetical. So hold on, let's see. Okay. <laughs> ah, look at that. Okay, this will go. Hello. Yeah, hey. we hear you. Yeah, this is Augusto. So um, that's a common problem in tunneling. the The way that I approach uh, the modeling of uh, uh, steel arches is using pile elements. Uh, essentially, you activate pile elements uh, every excavation step. Uh, you give the property corresponding to, you know, so H beam or any type of uh, structural um, organization layout that you you may have, and that's pretty much it. You can also accommodate uh, nonlinear behavior through the operator that Jim was showing before. Um, so yeah, it's certainly possible, uh, and also. Going back to the question about a fiberglass, uh, it's nothing different than a pile element. You just need to change uh, the property of the material because it's not steel, but fiberglass. Thanks, Augusto. Um, and then one more structural element question. Are structural elements FEM? I think the answer to that is yes. Am I right? Structural elements are formulated as explicit finite elements using shell theory, yes. Um, could you do a YouTube video of an octree meshing example? Great idea. We should definitely do that. <laughs> um, any trial date for the Linux version of Flag 3D? No, we're fairly long way away from having that ready to go. So um, I certainly can't give a date for the Linux version. Um, In structural elements, I would like to be able to assign the properties at the moment I am creating it in the same command, um, identifying it with previously defined properties. I don't, I don't think we do that, right? We assign the properties with a separate command. Yeah, right now it, it has to be two separate commands. I mean, I, I guess we could do that, but that would be a really long command in practice. And it, I, I don't know, to me, it seems sort of awkward. Um, what I suggest, is that typically the reason people don't like that is that it's difficult to identify the structure you've just created. But but in seven syntax, you can assign a unique name to the structural elements created in any given command so that you can easily identify them later in subsequent commands. So I would recommend looking into that. 
Um, will Itasca release a PDF version of the user manual? Um, we did PDF versions of some of the manuals in version six, and we could do that again in version seven. Um, it takes a little bit of effort on our side, but I assume that we, we could do that. We wouldn't do all of the manuals, um, but we could do some of them. <clears throat> um, there is a groundwater modeling program from Itasca. Is groundwater modeling, in fact, duty more efficient? I assume this person is talking about um, MindDW, which is a, another Itasca program that uh, specifically does open pit mine modeling and mine dewatering and things like that. Um, it is my understanding is it has a very efficient way of doing the groundwater um, calculations, which is almost certainly faster than what FLAC 3D does at the moment. Um, however, when we get the implicit fluid flow into FLAC 3D or the new implicit fluid flow into FLAC 3D, it might be comparable. So I can't say for sure because I haven't myself run mine DW, but um, I expect it's probably more efficient for doing fluid flow at the moment. Anybody else want to comment on that? <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. Uh, here's one for Joe. Has the P2P soil model been tested for long and intensive EQ? I'm not sure what that means. Say again, EQ. Yeah, I don't know what that means. I guess we can follow up on that one. Yeah. Is it possible to use new constitutive models and older versions of FLAG3D? No. Um, uh, okay, we're almost at the end here. <laughs> Is the program faster with more cores, with less individual speed, or less cores, but with higher individual speed? <laughs> you want to comment on that, Dave? Um, my answer is it, it's really impossible for me to say. Um, so much about FLAC 3D speed in practice is dependent on not only the details of your hardware, but details of what you're using in a particular model, that it's very hard for me to give my answer because that will apply to every situation. I will say that um, Memory bus speed and memory speed is as important as CPU speed in practice. So the faster your memory is, the more cores you will use efficiently before you start to bottom out. Um, and once you bottom out, it doesn't matter how many cores you add. Your, your speed up is going to be relatively modest because you just can't get the memory to it. OK. Um... The web key option is only for version 7, correct. So version 7 of FLAC 3D and also version 7 of 3DEC will allow you to use the web license, um, not for older versions. Um, when will IMAS be ready? Can we beta test it for you? That's from Luigi. Um, officially, our plan is to, to shoot for some time in the fall to release the IMAS model. Um, we might be able to do some beta testing before that. Um, anything you want to add to that, Joe? Uh, yes, we are combining uh, a lot of verification and validation examples uh, before we, 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 we officially release that. Um, okay, I've reached the end of the questions. Um, thanks everybody for, for joining and thanks for the questions. It's been great conversations and a lot of good feedback. Um, and again, we'll send out the webinar and the slides and uh, we'll follow up on some of these questions by email. So thanks, everybody, and especially Dave and Joe and Augusto for answering questions. <laughs>